The messages you are about to hear were first given on our daily radio broadcast. Pastor Warren Wiersbe is the speaker, and this series of 20 messages is entitled, The Famine of God's Word. It's a series of studies on the Old Testament prophet Amos. And here's our Bible teacher, Warren Wiersbe. What would you do if you heard a lion roar? There you are at the shopping center and you hear a lion roar. Or if you heard the weatherman say that an earthquake was about to occur, or perhaps that a tornado was coming. I think I know what you would do. You'd do the same thing I would do. You would head for a place of safety. Well, a lion is roaring. An earthquake is coming. A storm is on the horizon. And the prophet Amos tells us all about it. Amos chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Now, ah, there's the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion. That's the roar of a lion about to spring. And utters his voice from Jerusalem. Uh, that Hebrew word means thunders. He thunders his voice. A storm is about to come. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. There's a terrible drought. God is speaking. Now, we need to hear and to heed the book of Amos. It may not be a familiar book to you. I trust it will be familiar to you when we're through with this study. Because of uh, who wrote it, and because of when he wrote it, and because of why he wrote it, the book of Amos must be a part of our study. And so these are the three reasons why we're going to be studying the book of Amos. First, because of who wrote it. Who wrote it? A fellow named Amos. Now, Amos was a common man. He was not trained in the schools of the prophets. He tells us that himself in chapter 7 and verse 14. Amos had been challenged by Amaziah the priest. He was the high religious leader in the land. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet nor was I a son of a prophet. In other words, I wasn't trained in the prophetic schools. I didn't go through the usual preparation, but I was a herdsman and a tender of sycamore fruit. And then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. He was what we would call today a layman just an ordinary worker, a herdsman, a shepherd. It's amazing how many people God called who were shepherds. They knew how to take care of the sheep. When he was looking for a king to follow Saul, he chose a shepherd, David. Abel was a shepherd. Abraham was a shepherd. Isaac and Jacob were shepherds. And God likes to have shepherds, people who are concerned. Isaiah, you know, the prophet. Isaiah was an aristocrat. He belonged to the king's court. Jeremiah and Ezekiel were priests. But uh, Amos was just a common layman. As you read the book of Amos, you find many rural pictures. Here he talks about a lion roaring. I'm sure he heard many lions roar out there in the wilderness. He saw many a storm come sweeping across the land chapter 2, verse 13, he talks about being weighed down like a cart that is full of sheaves. That's a rural picture for you. He talks about the summer fruit, and he, he discusses other pictures that are definitely rural. Chapter 5, verse 19, here's a man running away from a lion, and he meets a bear. Finally, he gets home and leans against the wall, and there's a serpent to bite him. That sounds like a man who knows the out of doors. So Amos was a common man. He came from a place called Tekoa. You leave Jerusalem and go a little bit southwest, and you come to Bethlehem, and you go a little bit southeast, and you come to uh, Tekoa. Tekoa is about six miles from Bethlehem, about 11 miles from Jerusalem, just a bump in the road. He didn't come from Jerusalem or Athens. He didn't come from some big city. He was just a farmer who came from a small town, but he had God's hand upon him. As I was reading this, I was thinking about the number of people that God called who had no formal training. Now, don't get me wrong, I am in favor of preparation for ministry. I have taught in two different schools, I've lectured in a number of schools, 
I've written some books that are used as textbooks in schools. I am thankful for the preparation God gave to me in school. I thank God for it. But every once in a while, God reaches down and gets a hold of an Amos and says to us, now look, if I want to train somebody my way, let me do it. Uh, Charles Spurgeon never had any formal training in ministry. Neither did G. Campbell Morgan, the great British expositor, or Harry Ironside. I had the privilege of pastoring the church that he pastored for some 18 years. Ironside had no formal training for ministry. D.L. Moody was a shoe salesman whose education probably was at the level of 6th or 7th grade. Billy Sunday, a baseball player. You see, God can reach down and get a hold of people. He was a common man, but he was a called man. He was able to say, hear the word of the Lord. That's the kind of people we need. He didn't get up and discuss the local news. He didn't discuss all the political problems. He touches upon these things. He was called of God to give the word of God. He was a concerned man. The name Amos means to be burdened, to be loaded, a burden. He was a burdened man. He was burdened for the people of of Israel. The interesting thing is he came from Judah. You know, the uh, nation divided after the death of Solomon, and uh, Amos came from the southern kingdom of Judah, not the northern kingdom, but God picked him up out of the southern kingdom, moved him to the northern kingdom, and said, you preach to the people of Israel. Now, he could have gone back and preached the same thing to the people of Judah, but God sent him to Israel. He was an outsider. By the way, God may pick up somebody from the third world, somebody from Africa or Japan or India, and send that person to the United States and say, hear the word of the Lord. And you know what we're going to say when that person shows up? We're going to say, why don't you go home and tell your own people? We don't like an outsider to come and give us the message of God. But Amos was an outsider, a concerned man, a true patriot. I don't get the idea that Amos was dumb. He wasn't. He mentions 38 different places geographically. He quotes the Old Testament. He knew his Old Testament scriptures. God had trained him out there in the wilderness. God trained John the Baptist out there in the wilderness. He trained Moses out there in the wilderness. He would train more people today, except we don't want to go to the wilderness. We don't want the solitude, the suffering. We have to run to seminars. We have to run to conferences and conventions. And perhaps the reason we haven't heard an Amos lately is because The wilderness is not a great place to go. I think of A.W. Tozer, who was such a blessing to me, how God trained him in the wilderness. He had no formal training to speak of when it came to ministry, but God trained him in the place of prayer, the place of solitude, and what a blessing he still is to us. Amos was a courageous man. As an outsider, he went up to Bethel. Bethel is where the king, Jeroboam II, had his own personal chapel. And he had his own personal chaplain, Amaziah the priest. And all the services were beautiful and the music was wonderful. And then one day this farmer shows up in the beautiful place of Bethel and he says, Hear the word of the Lord. A storm is coming. An earthquake is coming. The lion is roaring. And the priest said, Go home. Preach to your own people. Don't come up here and interrupt what we're doing because this is the king's chapel. Well, I like the book of Amos, and I want to study it because of the man who wrote it. He is the kind of man we need today. Secondly, because of when he wrote it. The times of Amos are just like the times today. The Bible is not an ancient book when it comes to modern problems. The book of Amos talks about a time of peace. Judah was at peace. Israel was at peace. They were even at peace with each other. There was an international peace, a lull in the problems, and there was a time of peace, sort of like we have today. Oh, there are skirmishes going on here and there, but basically the nations of the world are not at war with each other. It was a time of prosperity. In fact, in Israel, under Jeroboam II, the times were just like Solomon's times. There was prosperity. They were moving from an agricultural to a commercial economy, just like today. People were moving from the farm to the cities, just like today, and people were building big, expensive houses, just like today. Chapter 3, verse 15, he talks about the uh, houses, the winter house, the summer house, the great houses, 
houses of ivory. Oh, we see it today. You just drive around and see the big houses that are being built today. Talks about the prosperity of the people. But uh, it was a time of great prosperity, a time of great piety. A religious uh, revival was going on. Not a real revival. It didn't go very deep. It's just like today, religion was popular. Why? Because the leading politicians were religious. The in thing was to go to church. The king did it. They had uh, concerts and they had sacrifices. They were bringing their sacrifices, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. They were making religious pilgrimages to key places in Israel, Bethel, Gilgal, Beersheba, and they were seeking to have a spiritual blessing. They were having a lot of concerts, I notice. Uh, Chapter 5 and verse 23, he says, Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. Why? Because all of this was shallow and hypocritical. Their piety was covering up their sin. It was tragic. Chapter 8, verse uh, 3, And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail. It was a time of prosperity because the poor were being exploited. The rich were getting richer. The poor were getting poorer. And yet everybody was patriotic. Oh, we're God's people. They were waiting for the day of the Lord. Like folks today who say, oh, I can hardly wait for the Lord Jesus to come back. Do you know what that really means for the Lord Jesus to come back? Oh, they were waiting for the Lord to come back. They were saying the day of the Lord. Chapter 5, verse 18, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? Suppose Jesus did come back today. Would he be impressed with our prosperity and our concerts and our public meetings and our sacrifices and our buildings? I don't think he would be. He'd be saying to us what he said to the people through the prophet, I want righteousness. I don't want this kind of thing. Seek good and not evil. Hate the evil. Love the good. Establish justice in the gate. They were prosperous because of injustice. The poor were getting poorer, the rich were getting richer, and the politicians were the ones who were getting all the gain. It was a time of poverty for many people. The prophet Amos shows up and says, God is not impressed with all of these things. God is going to come in judgment. We want to study this book because of who wrote it, Amos, a common layman who was dedicated to the Lord. We want to study this book because of when he wrote it. His times are like our times, times of international peace, times of economic prosperity, my, we're building, times of religious popularity. Oh, it's such an easy thing to go to a Sunday morning service. It's such an easy thing to go to a great big concert somewhere and say, wasn't that wonderful? And all the while, the poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer, and people are living on the exploitation of those who are helpless. There's injustice. People are saying, oh, the day of the Lord. Well, when that day comes, they'll be glad that they know Jesus is their Savior, but I wonder what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. Why did he write the book? Because of what he saw, the words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw. What did he see? Well, in chapters 1 and 2, he looked around and he saw judgment. And he gives eight indictments of judgment. He says to Syria and to the Philistines and to Tyre and Edom and Ammon and Moab and Judah and Israel, the storm of judgment is coming. Chapters 1 and 2, he looks around and there are eight judgments. Then chapters 3 through 6, he looks within. He looks right into the hearts of the people and he preaches three sermons. He says, God sees your heart, and God is going to send judgment. He said, I have sent famine. You haven't returned to me. I've sent drought. You haven't returned to me. I've sent blight and mildew and locusts. You haven't returned to me. I've sent sicknesses Even some local wars have taken place. I have sent catastrophes of one kind or another, even an earthquake, and you haven't returned to me. It sounds like today, doesn't it? What is it going to take to wake our people up that judgment is coming? 
chapters 1 and 2, Amos looked around and saw judgment, eight indictments. Chapters 3 through 6, he looked within and saw corruption. He was not impressed with their sacrifices and their concerts and their buildings. He saw the corruption down inside. They built their buildings because they took the money away from the poor, and they offered their sacrifices because of their unjust gain. Finally, in chapters 7 through 9, the prophet looks ahead, and he has five visions, five visions. He, he sees locusts, and he sees fire. He sees God with a plumb line measuring things, and he intercedes and says, Oh, Lord, please don't send judgment. And God said, All right, I won't. I won't do it. You see, the prophet is also an intercessor. This nation does not realize how much it depends upon people who pray. But finally, he ends up with a vision of hope. Chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, he says, I will, I will, I will, I will. I will raise up the tabernacle of David. There is a future for my people. Well, we're not going to be looking at a book in the past. We're going to be looking at a book that tells us about the present. He's not talking about what happened about, oh, 760 B.C. when Amos was ministering. No, he's talking about now. He's not talking about Israel and Judah. He's talking about our nations today. In fact, he's not talking about other people. He's talking about us. It's time for us to read this book and say, Lord, is it I? We don't like to realize it, but it's true. The lion is roaring. God is roaring and saying, you'd better listen. The earthquake is coming. The storm is on the horizon. There is a famine of the hearing of the word of God. Oh, may the Lord help us to be faithful and say, is it I? Is this what I need today? Thank you for listening to Back to the Bible. Join us again tomorrow. God bless you.